So when uh, political scientists think about borders or border studies, they're likely to immediately gravitate to what have been major orienting concepts for the discipline, like the nation state and citizenship. And I'm no exception in this regard. So in my talk today, I'll look at both formal and substantive Canadian citizenship. And what I argue is that since 2000, we've been seeing ways in which, in both areas, there's a rebordering of Canadian citizenship occurring in exclusionary directions. So to address this argument, I will proceed in three parts. Uh, first, I will overview what I mean by formal and substantive citizenship. Second, I will address the ways in which formal citizenship has become more exclusionary. And then finally, I will address the ways in which substantive citizenship has also become more exclusionary. So let me turn to uh, uh, the distinction between formal and substantive citizenship, uh, starting with formal citizenship. So whenever we flip through an atlas, which is a common reference in many people's homes, um, we are being shown a world in which the many colors of land spaces symbolically underscore that the seemingly natural order of the world is that of states. Now, of course, one can imagine other forms of social and political organization to the state, and scholars might document or archive human life before the nation state. But the reality is that in the modern world, one really requires having citizenship, having the passport of a state as a, pre as a precondition for fully enjoying the benefits of political membership and rights. And in fact, uh, the 1948 United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights grants a right to emigrate, that is, to leave one's country, but it does not back this up with a right to immigrate, that is, to enter and to stay in another country of one's choice. And this is exactly what accounts for the plight of those that uh, face conditions that induce forced migration, such as Syrian refugees today, uh, as well as the Filipinos uprooted in the wake of the typhoon that hit uh, less than a couple of weeks ago. So formal citizenship really just relates to having the status of citizenship, which entitles you to enter and legally stay in the state. Now in contrast, substantive citizenship relates to being able to enjoy equally the civil, political, and social rights that are associated with modern citizenship. And in the Canadian context, this has, since the 1960s and 70s, been supported by policies uh, relating to cultural pluralism. So one example would be uh, the 1971 Federal Policy of Multiculturalism, which uh, came to be enshrined in Section 27 of the 1982 Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Okay, let me turn to the second part of my, address, uh, my talk to address uh, how formal citizenship is being rebordered. So a major trend when it comes to immigration in the 21st century is that there has been an increasing use of uh, temporary migrant workers uh, who are denied Canadian citizenship. So if you look at this um, over uh, a period of three decades from the mid-1980s to the present, it's clear that all categories of temporary entrants have grown uh, in, in, in time. But it has uh, specifically been under um, the um, Harper Conservative government, which came to power in 2006, that the number of all temporary residents admitted annually to Canada has exceeded the number of those that are selected for permanent residence. And uh, just to illustrate this from a graph produced by the Canadian Council for Refugees uh, for the period of 2007 to 12, you can see that the red line uh, representing admitted temporary foreign workers is outpacing the blue line, which is representing the category of admitted permanent residents. There's also been a growing diversity and array of programs to facilitate temporary entry, with the consequence that there are a bunch of different rules and practices governing how temporary entrants are actually treated uh, in relation to employment, employment for spouses, as well as social services, including uh, settlement services. So in essence then, the policy turn uh, towards temporary workers um, and residents produces new lines of exclusion. And this also means that the inequality and forms of exclusion are not only between citizens and non-citizens who reside in Canada, but amongst non-citizens who reside in Canada. 
It's also uh, significant to note that many temporary workers are visible minorities, um, and so this is also etching a color line in relation to Canadian citizenship. In addition, there's what happens to permanent residents on the road to citizenship. So, uh, back in 1995, Canada, uh, following um, a trend seen in other countries, introduced an actual test for citizenship. And until recently, for the most part, permanent residents who took the test passed that test. So 95% of them passed the test. And that very small fraction of uh, people who failed uh, were uh, also able to uh, quite quickly see a citizenship judge and were awarded citizenship in 80% of the cases. However, uh, a new guide for studying about citizenship was issued in late 2009 by the Conservative government. And in 2010, there were changes made to that citizenship test. So the content was different and the number of questions one needed to get correct went up. And so while uh, the failure rates of previous tests were very low, they mushroomed uh, in recent years up to 30% of people failing. And with these increased failure rates, waiting times for seeing a citizenship judge increased. Um, and in some provinces, it was taking up to two and a half years to see a citizenship judge. Now, the federal government uh, announced in June of this year that people who failed uh, could actually retake the test once again to try and alleviate uh, the citizenship judge backlog um, that had occurred. But the fact is that the changes to the citizenship test are not neutral. Uh, there's a new emphasis on testing knowledge of English or French, and the questions are particularly challenging for groups coming from non-English speaking countries. Um, and so, for example, um, in 2011, nearly half of all immigrants from Afghanistan failed the test, and over 41% of immigrants from Vietnam failed the test. By way of contrast, 98% of immigrants coming from the US, from Australia, from uh, the UK, passed the test in 2011. Not least, um, there are uh, symbolic changes relating to formal citizenship, which are also not neutral when it comes to identity expression. So for example, in December of 2011, Jason Kenney, in his capacity as Minister of Multiculturalism and Immigration, announced that one's face could not be covered in a Canadian citizenship ceremony, effectively banning Muslim women wearing the niqab, uh, which is a head and face cover from citizenship, unless they removed it. So this change is symbolic in a way that actually has parallels with discussions now in Quebec over a values charter uh, which would ban uh, religious symbols or at least um, ostentatious religious symbols uh, from being worn by public sector employees. And this is even notwithstanding Jason Kenney posting pictures of himself recently uh, donning religious headgear uh, on a recent uh, trip to India. Okay, let me now turn to substantive citizenship. And again, there are indications of trends of a rebordering that's taking place um, that is uh, both racialized and gendered. And I will highlight uh, three major trends. So uh, first, uh, one major development concerns the fact that following September 11, 2001, there have been renewed policy emphases and justifications for security and surveillance that have been especially felt by those Canadians who are or who are perceived to be Muslim and or Arab. And this dramatically has exposed the fault lines of Canadian multiculturalism, uh, even though surveillance carries implications for all Canadians uh, when it comes to civil and political rights. Second, um, in addition to the fallout from September 11, which may be seen to especially target specific groups, there's also evidence of more generalized and growing racialized and gendered forms of inequality amongst immigrants and minorities. Uh, for example, it's clear that incoming immigrants, um, even if they have been selected for their high skills, um, they have not had the same success in the labor market uh, since the 1990s as they had, uh, for example, during the 1970s and 80s. Uh, many immigrant women in particular are tied into chains of care in which work is both poorly paid and demanding. Uh, the work performed by nannies, daycare workers, those in the service industry exemplify what I mean here. So because of these trends, uh, state retrenchment and social spending in times of austerity uh, may have really harsh consequences for certain groups such as recent immigrants and uh, some visible minorities as well as Aboriginal people. And then finally, um, I really do need to say something about uh, symbolic changes that may be thought to underscore 
a rebordering of Canadian citizenship away from a form of multicultural celebration and identity. So these themes uh, come out very clearly in the text and images of uh, the new guide for immigrants, Discover Canada, which as I noted uh, was uh, put out in 2009 in advance of changes to the citizenship chest. So this guide is aimed at helping immigrants selected for permanent residence prepare for the citizenship test. Uh, but it was also presented by Jason Kenney when he was Minister of Multiculturalism and Citizenship as promoting civic identity and pride for all Canadians. Uh, so in this context, it becomes very notable that in comparison to the previous guide, uh, the text in this guide uh, um, in, in quantitative terms puts much greater emphasis on the military and war and Canada's successes in war than the previous guide did. And Discover Canada also uh, promotes this in its images, uh, especially uh, in its images depicting Canada's history. So the point is that we're not seeing social history um, or the histories of diverse collectivities like women and minorities or indigenous people uh, in display in this guide directed at both the foreign born and Canadian born alike. So to uh, conclude, uh, there are a number of trends uh, which speak to ways in which both formal and substantive citizenship are being rebordered in the 21st century with specific implications for incoming immigrants and racialized minorities. And in this way, uh, the boundaries of exclusion um, are being reinforced in ways that I think make it a very good time for all Canadians to be asking, where do we draw the line? Thank you.